Some of you probably uh, were up early yesterday because, like me, you wanted to be live watching the royal wedding, <laughs> right? Of course, I didn't get up myself because I had forgotten about it. And so I was just watching the replay and highlights, and that was enough. You know, the wedding of the century, how many of you watched some of it or in the news, highlights of it? No? Yeah? Watched it. You watched it. You were connected to it online. You were looking at it, whatever it is. You know, yesterday, the St. George's Chapel, you know, it's inside Windsor Castle. That event was simply phenomenal. You know, for several days prior to the wedding, everywhere you go in the news, whether it's local news or national news, everybody was talking about the royal wedding. I suppose for many of us, you know, such such a weddings rekindle our, our, our innate desire for fairy tales and a happily ever after ending, isn't it? We're just transfixed when it comes to such events. You know, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, it estimates that 1.9 billion people were connected by mainstream and social media around the world. Can you imagine? 1.9 billion people watching this spectacle. Connected. Watching. But you know, there's an even better connection that was spotted in this wedding. Harry. You know Harry? Right. Megan. You know Megan? <laughs> right. I might be talking to people who don't know what's going on in the world. So, <laughs> Harry and Megan were holding hands almost the whole time in the wedding. Can you believe that? They were connected to each other the whole lot. And that in itself reminds me of our text this morning when Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me. I call it holding hands with Jesus. Abide in me. And so when you look at John 15, previous to that it was Thursday evening. You remember the story, the upper room, the Lord's Supper, Passover meal. That was Thursday night. They were there, the company with Jesus, the disciples. But this time, after the Lord's Supper, they said, let us go. They left the upper room and they were heading back to the Mount of Olives where they would really spend the night. And the Mount of Olives was just down the Kidron Valley and up a hill. It was just close by and that's where they went. But as they left the upper room, they would have seen the temple again and engraved on the temple gates would be a golden vine engraved in the temple gates. They would probably also see some vineyards along the way as they went to the Mount of Olives. You see, they would have seen that. And even in Israel, in Jerusalem, there was a story that was often told. And it's the story that we find in Psalm 80 that there is this vine that God had transplanted out of Egypt. And the story kept being told from generation to generation. A vine that was plucked out by the Lord himself out of Egypt, that is Israel. In other words, the vine represented Israel and their relationship with God. Now bear that in mind, there's a golden vine on the temple gate, there are vineyards around them, there's a story being told, and in the midst of all of that, Jesus said these words, I am the vine, the true one. I am the vine, the true one. It is a messianic claim. Not only was he saying, yes, Israel was the vine, but Israel was that predicted, prophesied nation that would be formed by God in order that through that nation, the prophecy that the seed of this nation will actually vanquish the serpent's head, the first gospel that we hear in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell because of their sin. There will be a Messiah who will crush the serpent's head. And when Jesus says, I am that vine, He's saying, I am your Messiah. But he continues on, he says, basically, 
So here we are, the true vine. He says these words, My father is the vine dresser. Now let me say this. Literally, my father is George. George. Like George Marte over there. My father is George because George is actually a Greek, Greek word. It's transliterated into English exactly the way it's spelled. Georges. And that is where you get the word geo, 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 which is earth, and ergo is work. And so the vine dresser is the earth worker. He is the farmer, he is the gardener, he is the vine dresser, all rolled into one. He works the earth in order for it to be fruitful. My father is the one that works the earth. He is the one that works the branches. He's the one who's at work in your life in order to produce fruit. Now, here it tells us that this father, the vine dresser, has two specific tasks. Verse 2 goes like this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Two tasks the father has. He truncates non-bearing branches. Truncate. He cuts it off. Completely cut off. He truncates fruitless branches. And the other work he does, he trims fruitful branches. There is no in-between. He either truncates the fruitless one, chops it off, and the other one is he would trim, prune those that are bearing fruit so that it may bear more fruit, right? So here it is, two options. If we are his branches, there's only two possibilities. We either bear fruit or we don't. There is no in-between. Jesus doesn't give any other possibility. In fact, the destinies are also very clear. If we are fruitless, we're thrown away. We're burned. If we're fruitful, we are trimmed. We're pruned some more. Again, there are no other options. It's either we're thrown away or we're trimmed to be more fruitful. Now the question is, what is fruit in the New Testament? What does it mean to bear fruit? You know, that word fruit is used 66 times in the Bible, in the New Testament. 66 times. And you know what some of us will say? Probably fruit means uh, soul winning. That the fruit of being a follower of Christ is we win souls for Jesus Christ. And that is true. However, that word for soul winning, fruit of our soul winning, is only used once out of the 66 times. In other words, fruit in the Bible, 65 times in the New Testament, it refers to... The fruit of godliness, the fruit of life change, the fruit of character change. In other words, it refers to the production, it refers to the manifestation of Christian virtue in our lives through the action of the Holy Spirit. Change in our attitudes, change in the way we conduct ourselves. So fruit is that development of the spiritual life. The development of spiritual life, some of which we will see later on in this passage. So you remember Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? And then there's also fruit that you'll find in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. It talks about moral excellence. It talks about perseverance and all those things that are part of what it takes to have a godly character. And so in Jesus' allegory of the vine, every true follower bears fruit and the normal progress is fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. In other words, we are changing all the time for the better. For the better. And if we are not changing at all in terms of godliness, that's a problem. Because that is abnormal. 
The normal Christian life is to bear fruit and then more fruit and then much fruit. To simply profess faith in Jesus Christ but remain fruitless is unnatural. You see, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is certainly awesome. But you see, knowing that truth is not quite the same as possessing, acquiring that truth. You see, we're not saved by mere profession of faith. We're not saved by raising our hands. We're not saved by standing up. We're not saved by going to the front and making a profession. Although that is the behavior we find, but that in itself doesn't save. That's why R.C. Sproul in Ligonier.org had this to say. We are not saved by mere profession of faith, but by the possession of faith, and that faith inevitably bears fruit. Inevitably. Works doesn't save, but it is the faith in Jesus Christ that transforms us, changes us, and eventually we bear fruit. That is the faith that saves. And so fruit bearing is the key. And so the question for us is, how do I bear fruit? What is the formula for fruitfulness? I'll give you five, and this will be very quick. It's as simple as A, B, C, D, E. Five things, right? Formula. And the first is simply this. It is the main thing. And the four simply flows from this one. Abide in Christ. And so verse four goes like this, right? I abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. So here is the main formula to fruitfulness. Ten times in seven verses, that word abide is used. Ten times. Now, you might see in your translations, I don't see abide ten times. Actually, it's the same word that might be translated differently, but it's the same word. Sometimes it's abide, sometimes it's dwell, sometimes it's remain, sometimes it's continue, sometimes it's stay. You know, all of those words have one common word in Greek. And here, it's simply, in my translation, it is abide. Now, what does that mean? Well, you see, it, it's a word that means stay. Stay put, remain. And some others actually say, take residence. In other words, make it your home and don't move. Just stay where you are, remain. Continue on where you are. Don't move. Abide in Christ. Take your tents and pitch it deep in Christ. That's how to stay connected. And so, in today's modern world, it's probably good to translate it as simply to be connected. Now, how many of you, can you show me your cell phone? Show me your phones. Come on, come on, come on, man. Take your phones. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Right? Here's your phone. Now, the reason I have this is because I have an illustration. Otherwise, I don't bring my phone here. But here it is. You, have, you all probably have these phones, these kinds of phones, Right? Can you turn it on? No? Oh, come on. Turn it on. Right? right. Oh, what do you see? You see notifications? You see some messages that have come in? Maybe you've read it all together. And maybe right now you're reading it and not listening. And that's fine. Right? What does it say? It says you're all connected somewhere to somebody. Whether or not you see that person or not, you are connected in any time that somebody can reach you anytime. You are online. You are connected. 24-7, you are connected through that phone, aren't you? Right? Some of you don't turn phones anymore off. You just keep on, you know, charging it and recharging it, right? You're always connected. That's why some of you lack sleep. Because you're always connected. Connected. Now, if you are that tech savvy today, let me 
Let me, let me urge you. Be spiritually tech savvy. And be connected with the Lord Jesus Christ 24-7. Connected to him. I mean, regardless of what you're doing, you can be connected to Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying. Abide in, stay, don't leave, stay with me, regardless of where you are, regardless of what you're doing. No matter how busy you are, stay with me. Stay with me. In other words, Jesus is asking not for a superficial kind of a connection, but a connection wherein there is this vital, life-sharing relationship. You know, not only do I connect and charge, but actually, he's giving you power. Not only do you reconnect to charge your Tesla car, right, to a battery source, he actually gives you power, and there is an exchange going on. It's to be vitally connected. You see, that is our source of life. We are dependent on that source of life. For many of us, you know, we become extremely dependent on our mobile devices. I mean, some of us actually have anxiety attacks when some of these devices are taken away from us. That's how addicted we are to being connected online. But here's the deal. May we be addicted as well to abide in Christ. Spiritually, tech savvy, connected to Him 24-7. You see, connectivity is life. The same is true spiritually. Hold hands with Christ. Keep being connected. Abide in our Lord Jesus. The second B is this. Bathe in confession. So verse 3 goes like this. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. What does that mean? You remember an hour or so ago in the upper room, remember at the Lord's Supper, Jesus said to Peter, when Peter resisted his feet to be washed, you remember? He said, oh, the, you are not to wash my feet. And then when Jesus said something like, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then Peter said, well, I'll take a bath then. You know, bathe me, everything, you know, all parts of my body. And Jesus said something like this. He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. The same word, you are already clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, he says. Not all of you are clean. So Jesus reminded his disciples, first of all, they are clean because of their right standing with God. Clean, forgiven, through what it says, through the word which I've spoken to you. Now, you understand, you are Greek scholars already, right? And the word for word in Greek is logos. Very good. Logos, right? You know logos. And of course, there's two words in Greek translated word. One is logos. The other is rhema. Right? Here, Jesus said, because of the logos which I've spoken to you. Meaning, it's because of the word that became flesh. That's me. Because God wanted to reveal himself to you. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh. Logos. And God communicated his love to you through me. And here I am. You are already clean because of me. The word. The logos. And I am here communicating the heart of the Father to you. You're already clean. But of course, in John 13, he says, but you need your feet to be washed. Right? Just your feet, not all of you, because you're already clean. Just your feet. And what does that mean? Because every single day, we still sin. Every single day, we still need forgiveness. Every single day, we need restoration from fellowship with God. Because every time there is sin, somehow God is blocked from doing all that he wants in and through us. And so we need our feet to be cleansed, to be washed, just our feet. And what is that? Confession. We bathe ourselves in confession. You know, the word is the pruning instrument that takes away you know, the word of God, it says. The word is the instrument that prunes. It takes away the clogged cholesterol off our spiritual arteries. You know what I'm saying? It's like... It's like here we are, we're branches, but sometimes it gets clogged. 
and the life source just cannot bring the life into the branch because it's clogged with disease maybe, with decay maybe, with sin. But the Word is that instrument called simvastatin. <laughs> right? Statins. Huh. Now you're talking. Now we know what we're talking about, right? It's to somehow remove all that cholesterol that's clogging our veins and arteries, right? The Word of God. Bathe in confession. You see, here it is. It is a spiritual breathing exercise. But when we inhale God's forgiveness, we exhale all of our sins. That's why we bathe in confession. We say, well, you are already clean, but not all of you. Some of you need to wash their feet. Why? Because we lose that fellowship with him because of our sins. So we bathe ourselves in confession. Here's the third. You continue in his words. So verse 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, he says. My words abide in you. Now earlier it was logos. You are already clean through the word logos. This time if you abide in me and my words, rhema, abide in you. What's the difference? Well, it is his everyday word to us. It is the scriptures to us. It is every time I commune with God, he tells me something different about himself, about me, about my world, that I learn his words, his utterances, the scriptures. The words abide in you. Very words of Jesus. His teachings, insights from the word applied in real life. These would take up residence in the heart of the disciple. And later on we'll find out once that happens in our lives, the Word takes residence in us. Something beautiful is going to happen. I'll tell you about that later on. And so see, continue. Again, that's the word abide. Continue in His words. Scriptures. His words. Fourth, dwell in His love. That's another word for abide. Abide in His love. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Now Eugene Peterson somehow trans translated or paraphrased it this way. He said, we are to bask and dip into the cesspool of God's unconditional, abundant, and transforming love. Now obviously this goes against the grain of modern living. This kind of a, a love that is so transforming, abundant, and unconditional. That is actually quite foreign from the world. Now, some of you might have listened to the sermon, the message of Bishop Michael Curry at the wedding. He talked about love, isn't it? The power of love, right? Well, it is indeed very powerful, this love of God. That's very true. But I think he failed somehow in really declaring the gospel for what it is. But that's fine. You see, the gospel, God's love for us, is not simply a kind of love that we seek to imitate. You know, that's kind of a moralism, isn't it? You know, we, we just imitate Jesus' example. And of course, his examples are powerful, but it's not just seeing who Jesus is and trying to be like him. That's... That's what people say we're guilty of, moralism. It's the same as legalism. We simply try to be what Jesus is, and that's okay. But you see, it's not about our power to be like him. It's not about just trying hard to be more like him. It's about his love getting into me, and that kind of a love gets into me in such a way that it makes me repent of all of my sins. And it makes me understand who I am before God and before Him. All I can really do is to humble myself and surrender myself and drown myself in the kind of love that only He can give that is unconditional. It's not because of what I've done. It's not because of me. It's not because of who I am. It's simply because He loves me. And it is that kind of a love through the cross that I am changed. We cannot love the same kind of love if we merely imitate Him. 
that love needs to work itself in our hearts to transform us. And here's the deal. You know, sometimes if, if you are honest, and I'll try to be honest with you, you see, many a times I try to earn love. Many a times I live my life trying to earn somebody's pleasure. And that's a hard way of living. Very hard. Two weeks ago, I confessed to the people in the prayer meeting. I confessed. I was sharing. And I said, you know, I, I am very tired. I've come to the point where I am people weary. Is there such a word? People weary. And I just get tired of constant exposure, engagement with people. And after a while, you just have no energy. You just feel so exhausted. You see, that kind of a life, I get more exhausted when I begin to play the game that the reason I perform and the reason I do, the reason I move is because I always seek to earn the love of others. I seek to earn the pleasure of somebody. I seek to live according to the expectation of somebody else. And after a while, I'm exhausted because I forget in this momentary spiritual space of my life that the only reason I am alive and I'm able to do and work is because of God's love for me and that is all that is really necessary brothers and sisters for you and me to live this life and know without a shadow of a doubt that this God loves me through Jesus Christ and that is all I really need in this life that is really all that's why Jesus says Drown yourself in this cesspool of my love. Because that's what it's going to take for your life to be so vital, for your life to truly change. It's to be the kind of person he wants you to be. And that's only going to happen when I drown myself, submerge myself in his love and not anybody else's. Dwell in his love. And so settle down. Fasten your eyes on me, not on somebody else. See how much I love you, not because of anything you can do, have ever done, but simply because I choose to love you. And the cross, the cross is that proof of his love for you and me. And so what it is about abiding that's so difficult? You know, one of my favorite movies of Disney is this. What my favorite Disney movie is? Animated. What? Frozen? Frozen? <laughs> Let it go. Exactly, Pinocchio. There you go. <laughs> Pinocchio. That's my favorite Disney movie. And some of you younger people say, what? Well, what's Pinocchio? Well, Pinocchio. And remember the cricket? What's his name? Jiminy, Jiminy Cricket. And what is Jiminy? He's the conscience of Pinocchio. Remember, Pinocchio was a wooden toy. And then suddenly he had life. But he had no conscience. And so Jiminy, the cricket, was his conscience. And so when every time he does a bad thing or lies, you know what happens? His nose gets bigger, longer and longer, right? So you know the story. Ah, oh, good for you. See, this is my favorite. See, there's one scene where there's one scene where Jiminy is frightened. Because Pinocchio finds out about this life that he has. You know, it's like it's like suddenly he's he's moving, he's able to walk. He can do things, you know. Suddenly he feels independent because there's light. But there are, you see, bad elements along the way, like the foxes. You remember the foxes? And they're out there to tempt people and Pinocchio at that. But Pinocchio is innocent, ignorant. And so Jiminy's like almost biting his... No, crickets don't have nails. <laughs> but you know what I mean? He's like he's so afraid, being the conscience of Pinocchio, that Pinocchio would just 
follow along innocently with every influence under the sun. And so he's so afraid because Pinocchio might just decide to go along with the deceitful foxes, and he does, right? You see, temptation is like that. It's like it's telling us, you know what? There's something out there. There's something outside the garden. There's something that you are not experiencing because you've been kept from it. You see, the temptation is God doesn't really love you. He doesn't. Because if he loves you, he's not going to deprive you of all these nice things. See, he's a killjoy, right? See, that's a temptation. And so what do we do? Instead of staying with God, instead of dwelling and staying put and taking residence in Christ, when the temptation comes, we say, you know what? I need a new house. This house doesn't make me happy anymore. And so it looks like the fixer-upper is much better than where I'm living. You know, there, there's something out there that's far better than where I am right now. See, that's a temptation. And so what do you do? You open the door, you move, you detach, you disconnect, you unplug, and now you are on your own. Jesus said, dwell, take residence in my love. Don't be tempted to think that there's something out there that I cannot give you far beyond what you can even understand in terms of satisfaction. The fifth is simply enjoy his commands. I use the word enjoy because I think that's what it is. Verse 10 goes like that. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, God's commands are like fences. They are like borders, right? Just like in the Garden of Eden when God said, all these trees, all their fruit, all of it, are for you to partake, except one. You see, that command is like a border. You see, there's another tree outside this domain of my full blessing upon you. It's over there on the other side of the fence. You see, the fence is the command, stay. It's over there. But you see, when you really enjoy his commands, you know what you're saying is just, Boy, I really understand now what his love for me is. And so it's really easy to obey his commands. It's not so hard. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, his commands are not burdensome. You see, when we understand what love is, commands are welcomed, embraced. They are enjoyed. Keep my commandments. You'll abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands, abide in his love. You see, we're safe in this soul-satisfying area. We abide in his constant and abundant love. And so there you have it. Every time I'm tempted to disobey, to trespass, to cross the border onto the other side, thinking there's something better for me on the other side, every temptation I have ever faced in my life leads to this one satanic strategy, really. It's to get me out of my perched position in Christ and to believe there's something better outside. You know what? At that spiritual juncture, at that spiritual moment of my life, I could just imagine the angels watching and gasping and actually saying to themselves, Oh, Pastor Carlos, stay where you are. Don't move. It's a trick. Because when you do, guess what? You're dead. You're dead. And so enjoy Enjoy his commands. That's the formula. There's three more things, and I'll try to be as quick as I can. You see, there are causes to fruitlessness. Factors that lead to a fruitless life. It's simply this one verse in verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm going to mention three things that I think form fruitlessness in our lives. This is more of an application already. But you see that word apart is the same word for separate, alienate, isolate. 
And so we like living isolated lives. You know, that word apart is like the battle cry of every American. Independence, right? Self-sufficiency. And the quicker I can set myself apart, the better it is. You see, that word is actually a cry of autonomy. It is a cry that we all want because we don't really want to be held accountable. We don't want I don't want people watching me all the time and watching my every move. I don't want. We don't like to be held accountable. And that's what that word means, apart. And isolation from the faith community. Now, I'm not saying we're a perfect community at all. But isolation from people who are all connected to God is a sign that the fruitless life is beginning to creep in. See, the reason we have spiritual disciplines is to keep us firmly connected to the source of life. You see, one side of us says we are dependent. We need a life source. That's why we're plugged in. We're connected. We're dependent in that life source, on that life source. But on the other hand, we also need to be a people of discipline. See, dependence is like just simply yielding, isn't it? But you see, we need discipline because that's what it takes to keep us connected. Otherwise, we drift further and further away. The second thing is this. You see, apart from me, there's this erosion of devotional capacity or devotional life, the quality of my relationship with God. See, the next thing I know, this slow erosion of our capacity to till the soil of our soul. You know, there is no longer my, any desire to remain connected with God because we've found alternate soul-deadening connectedness with other things. It's soul-deadening. You know, and we think they are life-giving, but in the end we realize they are not. Erosion. And the third is simply this. You can do nothing. And the temptation is to, I can do many things. I am somebody, I've got skills, i got gifts. What do you mean I can't do anything apart from him? I can do a lot of things apart from him. You cannot do anything that is useful, that is transformative, that ultimately brings glory to God. Nothing whatsoever. The temptation, of course, is I can be my own captain. I am the captain of my soul. I don't need anything. Parting shot, that final stroke of pulling the plug is to declare, I am. Not Jesus, but I am. And so it leads to this fate of fruitlessness. What is the outcome of fruitlessness? And so verse 6 goes like this. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch, dries up, they gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, that is probably the greatest challenge to interpretation. Because the question is, okay, what's the identity of the fruitless branch? Who are those fruitless branches? Is that a fair question? Who are they? Well, in my study, I think I've come up with at least three different interpretations. And I'll share them with you, and then I'll tell you which I think is the right one. The first interpretation, fruitless branches are true Christians who finally perish. In other words, you can lose your salvation. They are true Christians, but who lose their salvation and they perish. Now, obviously, this runs counter to what I believe is a consistent pattern in biblical teaching that eternal life is truly unending. And when Jesus says, I am the life and I give you eternal life, it's not as if, well, it's no longer eternal because I take it away from you. You see, the Bible constantly teaches us that we are eternally secure, that Jesus Christ and the Father are keeping believers secure in him. And so it cannot be that first where true Christians suddenly perish. The second interpretation is this. 
true Christians, these are true Christians who experience death, physical death, as a discipline in their lives. In other words, because you are not living the kind of life that God wants you to live and you are constantly disobeying Him, He's going to kill you. I mean, you're going to die. That's a penalty for your waywardness. So you might be a true believer, true follower, but you're going to die ahead of schedule, basically, right? Now, there is a bit of a problem there because here there is reference to fire, that they are burned. You know, some say, well, the fire represents the burning of their unfruitful work. And that is true in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there is the judgment seat of Christ where believers' works will be judged. And some of the works will be burned with fire because they're made of stubble, wood, right? So that is true. But you see here, fire and burning does not refer to the unfruitful work. It refers to fire and burning of the branch itself. It is not the work of the branch, but the branch itself that is placed in the fire. So, physical death, well, it doesn't really sever our connectedness with Christ, does it? In fact, for those who are real believers in Jesus Christ, severance physically from this physical earth actually ushers us in to being face-to-face with God. And so it cannot be that. And so the third is what I believe it is all about. The third interpretation is this. Fruitless branches are those who merely profess faith in Jesus, but they are finally severed because their faith is superficial, just like Judas. Some of you are not clean, Jesus said. You see, Judas was with Jesus for three years. I mean, he was connected to Jesus. He served Jesus. He saw Jesus' miracles. He heard his teachings. He followed him wherever he went. But still, he did not possess the life-sharing relationship with him. In other words, everything was external. Everything was nominal. Everything was just cultural. Everybody follows a rabbi, and I just happened to follow Rabbi Jesus. And so it was mere profession without a possession of faith. And you see, all of us here, the reason you're here is because we all are professors. We all profess belief and faith in Jesus Christ. But you know what? Merely professing is no guarantee that we are a real branch. It is no guarantee. And so the fate of those unreal branches, they're thrown into the fires of hell. The good thing is we don't end there. You see, there are what I call the flavors of fruitfulness or the favors, if you want it termed that way. Flavors or favors of fruitfulness. What's the outcome of a fruitful life? Well, there's four things. Very quickly, our prayers get answered. Second part of verse 7, ask whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. Can you believe it? Everything you ask, he will grant you. Now, if we're genuinely connected with him and his words make residence in us, then under these conditions where his words take residence in me, I can ask anything and I'm going to get it because that's what he promised. The context tells us that I am connected to him. His words are connected with me. My life is shared with him. He shares his life with me. And whatever I ask, because now I'm saturated with his word, dwelling in me, whatever I ask, it shall be done for me. Wow. That is powerful, isn't it? Whatever you seek, you will get when the words of Christ dwell in you. That's why the Apostle Paul says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. Because when it does, when you pray, 
this is really the, the, the kind of relationship we want, right? It's not just ignoring him and taking some time to pray a little bit of prayer. Lord, bless me. Bless my children and thank you for the food. You know, it's not simply that, but it's an exchange, a sharing of life. The second thing that happens, flavors of fruitfulness, our Father gets displayed. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. You see, when we bear fruit, the godliness, the character that emulates who Christ is, guess what? We begin to adorn and clothe ourselves with who and what God looks like. When something happens to our characters, our attitudes, and the way we behave, all these things somehow begin to show that there's somebody in you transforming you, and we begin to adorn the face of God himself. We make God more visible in us. You know how it is in celebrity-oriented worlds. You know, when you're a follower of Christ and you're a celebrity... They always talk about platform. Platform. You have a platform in order to tell so many people about God, the gospel. Platform, right? Because you're famous, right? And so you use the stage, you use, the, you use media, you use all these things to portray as far as you can the words of Christ, who God is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Platform. But let me say this. The greatest platform that you and I have, and we don't need to be celebrities. The greatest platform you and I have is to adorn the character of Christ in my life. Because when we do, it's Christ coming out of us. He gets displayed. The Father is glorified. You see, His glory is the weight of His person when we come face to face with Himself. And so when we clothe ourselves with a godly character, His glory is in us, and He is glorified. See, don't talk about platform or stage, because you can have all the stage you want and all the media attention you want, but if your life does not reflect the character of God, it's useless. That's how you and I have a platform, and the platform is this person, you, adorning yourself, with Jesus Christ. Third thing, our discipleship gets okayed. The second part of verse 8 so this says this, and so prove to be my disciples. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. In Matthew 7, Jesus actually said, how do you discern false from true prophets, or true from false prophets? And he basically mentioned the principle that we can also use for this. He basically said, you will know them by their fruits. You will know the genuine and the false by their fruits. Same word. In other words, you will know the disciples of Jesus Christ also by their fruits. Not the profession of faith, although that is the introduction, right? The introduction into a life of faith. But it isn't that necessarily because we can fake it all the time. We can only pay lip service all the time because, again, we want people to somehow be pleased with us. And so here, our discipleship, you are indeed a follower of Jesus Christ because of your fruit. Now, let me say this because people ask all the time, how do you really know? How do you really know that you have eternal life? How do you really know that you are saved? How do we know that somebody is saved? And let me say this. In the end, ultimately, nobody really knows except two people. You know who that is? God the Father and the person himself or herself. Only they know. We can only assume by what we see and what they profess. But ultimately, only two know the answer. You, because the Spirit of God actually testifies in your soul that you are a child of God. But God also knows all things. He knows your heart. He knows whether it's false or true. Right? So how do you know? We actually don't know. We only presume in accordance to what we observe. Our discipleship gets okay. 
Now, there's two things. How do you really know? Well, let me mention this. There is an objective and subjective way of knowing. The objective way is simply this. Well, I know because God's word says so. That's objective. You see, he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God doesn't have the life. Right? In other words, John says, I, I actually write this to you so that you may know that you have life because the son is in you. And so that is objective. In other words, if really you have somehow one time in your life said no to sin and come to faith in Jesus because that is the only way and you have allowed him to enter your life, then objectively, yes, you have life. But you see, there is a subjective way. Subjective way is the fruit of your life. Where is the fruit of your life? Because saving faith will produce that kind of fruit. But it is subjective because fruit doesn't come automatically. There is a season of fruitfulness. But it should happen because that is normal. So your discipleship gets okayed. And finally, one more. Our joy gets loaded. Wow. And so Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be made full. Your joy may be overflowing to the brim. It's loaded, right? I mean, how many of you go to the gas station and you, you, you fill your tank fully? But some of you, you know, the thing already ejected and you still look inside and see whether, you know, the gas is still floating in there or is it inside and you put more. And especially when you're at Costco, you put more. You put as much as you want, right? To the brim. That's the kind of joy that Jesus promises those that are connected to him. You know, what's going to give me the greatest possible joy here on earth? What's going to give you the greatest possible joy here on earth? Surely one of them is, you know, when I was much younger, surely one of them is when my parents are so proud of me. That thrills me no end. When we see their smiles and hear their applause for their son or daughter, boy, that gives me incredible joy. Nothing in this world gives me inexplicable and incomparable joy than to know that Jesus is smiling at me with sheer delight. If you get joy simply because your parents love you, and are proud of you, think about it, Jesus himself. Think about him smiling at you. That's the kind of joy he wants you to have overflowing. You see, this tells us that Jesus will be at it until this cup of joy has at length been filled to the very brim. You know, the author of Hebrews tells us, Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. Now, what is that joy that was set before him? Have you asked that question yourself? What is that joy that was set before him that he was able to endure the cross? Well, it's the joy of finishing the work of redemption so that you and I can have a life that is saved, transformed, used for his glory. That's why John himself says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. No greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. And so there you have it. Stay connected. And you understand what the formula looks like of connectedness. There are perils and warnings. Because without fruit, we need to ask ourselves the question, Lord, what is the matter? with me am I connected or am I not you know one of the most excruciating decisions family members make is when to pull the plug on a dying loved one you see yesterday while I was watching the highlights of this connected holding hands I had a phone call we had a phone call in church because there was this dying lady here in Baldwin Park, who called for a pastor. 
because she was in the throes of death. And so I had to somehow grudgingly turn off my TV and go over in Baldwin Park and see who is this lady because we don't know who she is. I mean, there is a name, but we just don't know who she is. But they know about Cornerstone. And so I came and met them. There's a family and, and the man in there, his name is Carlos. I said, this is divine appointment. Your name is Carlos and Irma and Amalia and Georgina. And there's this lady in comatose with all these tubes connected to her. She's connected to some life-giving mechanism. And the hardest thing is to say, let's pull the plug. Because there is no sign of life anymore. You see, on the spiritual realm, it is like this. When the vine dresser takes a look at all the branches and he finds why is there no life and no fruit in this branch, he's going to pull the plug. Pull the plug. Because he was really never connected in the first place. So where are you? Are you a mere professor of the faith? Or are you a possessor of saving faith that inevitably leads to fruit-bearing? <laughs>